So it's uh, uh, in in Taiwan. Uh, we uh, at Nanhua University. We 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 uh, emphasize on uh, the effort to uh, to have, to make an, a sustainability center okay, and uh, try and uh, to uh, uh, carbon balance okay campus. So we we uh, uh, okay. So thank you. Yeah. So we uh, uh, declare maybe uh, in ten years we will uh, reach uh, the. Uh, carbon balance. So your experience, experience and your uh, help will be uh, very helpful to uh, to us. Okay. <laughs> so I think uh, I believe that uh, a lot of people are uh, now waiting in the conference room. We, we today we, we have two two conference room. Okay, because of the, uh, the COVID nineteen something like that. Yeah, it, it, in town is uh, is okay, but but uh, we we still very careful. Okay. So uh, maybe in a few minutes, I will uh, uh, let you know how, uh, when to start. And if you want to speak directly or use your video, we, we already had, the, had your video. Mr. Hank Peter? Yeah, can you hear from me? Yes, I can hear you. Not okay. so very good, but... Uh... I'm, I'm very happy to be with you this morning, yes. uh, this afternoon for you. Yeah. And, uh, I hope that Eventually. my words on climate farming and carbon farming will be helpful for your discussion. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, I was uh, a professor in uh, organic agriculture, and now I retired and as an uh, organic farmer. You know, I, I have a very small farm. <laughs> okay. So, uh, very nice to meet you, and I, I hope maybe next time uh, we can invite you to uh, visit the Taiwan, okay? Yes, it <laughs> okay. would be very nice. Okay, very good. Thank you, yeah. So, it's in a few minutes, okay, we are start, okay? So, so you, you uh, if we can use your video, or uh, you want to speak again directly, no, that is okay. You, we can use the video. Okay, okay, okay. So you just hear it. Just us. Uh, we are hearing from you. The same, okay? Good. Okay, so see you later. Okay, maybe in, in just a few minutes, okay? Thank you. Welcome you all for the afternoon session of 2022 Sixth International Symposium on Sustainable Development and Green Technology. Uh, in this event, we the sixth International Symposium on Sustainable Development and Green Technology. Uh, in this event, we the Now we are going to start our afternoon session. For this first speech, I would like to invite as a speaker, Dr. Hines Peter Smith, and as the host, Chairman Chen Si Xiong. Now, Chen Chu Chi and Chen Si Xiong, Li Zhang, Yi Chi Chu Chang, and Dr. Hines Peter Smith. Okay, yeah. So, Mr. Hines Peter, we are uh, starting now. Okay, and uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, we are so glad that uh, we invite. Uh, a scholar, very famous scholar, uh, Mr. Hans Peter Schmidt. He has been uh, a pioneer in the field of biochar since 2008. He has worked on all aspects of biochar, including the creation of wild variety of biochar production uh, equipment. Biochar production in high and low technology, 
generics. The application technologies, for your trial design, biochar uh, characterization, and biochar education. The creator of uh, Istaka Journal. Okay, so it's a very famous journal. Okay, very useful, very respectable journal. Okay, in addition, Hans Peter has designed and used biochar plaster as building materials and is working with re researchers on its use in 3D printing. He has extensive experience working across Europe and has worked on developing world projects as well, including Nepal, Bangladesh, and Ghana. Okay, so, uh, Mr. Uh, Thanks, Peter. Would you like before you are uh, we uh, use your uh, video? Would you like to speak to uh, uh, the participants in the conference room now? Let's say a few words. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is a great pleasure to be with you this morning and that you allow me to talk about the potential of organic farming in climate mitigation activities as i think organic farming will be key to achieve the objectives with the ipcc and the world government to reduce the impact of climate change and i hope that uh, my presentation will be helpful for your further discussion on this topic. And I myself, I hope to be uh, with you in Taiwan uh, one of the next years. Thank you so much for your attention. I will be ready for any questions after the talk. OK, thank you very much. OK, let's start uh, the uh, presentation of uh, Mr. Hans-Peter. OK, please. Dear participants, I'm very proud to talk to you today about organic farming in combination to carbon farming systems um, to avoid climate change as a key technology uh, for negative emissions and how we can uh, combine uh, organic farming and climate technologies. Um, to um, to set the the background it's very well known um to the global community that uh, we need to curb the emissions and reduce the emissions until 2050 uh, by at least 90 percent of um, the emissions that we still have today but that would not be enough to uh, avoid uh, the worst effects of climate change so we need additionally to the emission reduction the active removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and the sequestration in the terrestrial system and the amount that is needed uh, from now until 2100 about um, is well known uh, it is at least 800 gigaton of CO2 uh, to compensate the effects of the CO2 that's already emitted. And it depends on the continuous emissions um, that we see until the next uh, decades, uh, if we need even more than 800 gigaton CO2 equivalent to sequester. But that's that's the background. That's We know we need this amount, um, this enormous amount of carbon to be sequestered uh, in the terrestrial system. And um, there are not so many possibilities how to do it. It is called negative emission technologies or NETs, uh, which means that um, those uh, carbon dioxides that were emitted has to be um, captured from the atmosphere that's why they call it negative um, 
even if it's positive for the climate. So there are two types of um, negative emission technologies. Um, there are persistent and measurable um, technologies that, that are more on an industrial scale. Um, here we have um, what is called direct air capture and carbon storage ducts. Uh, that means uh, the air is filtered and CO2 is extracted and then the CO2 is um, either transformed into um, higher carbon hydrocarbons like methanol or it's um, mineralized and sequestered um, in the uh, subground or there is enhanced weathering that means um, these are like uh, stone powders from volcanic stones and that get uh, carbonized. Um, but this is this is heavy technology and it's not ready yet and it's not really known how to sequester um, so large amounts of carbon dioxide. So there are also nature-based solutions and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, is the well-known afforestation and reforestation. So every tree that grows uh, extracts carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, however, when, when the tree um, is felled or falls down and then it's biologically degraded, all the carbon dioxide goes back to the atmosphere. So we have not only um, the obligation to grow more trees, but also to capture um, the carbon from the trees or from other biomass in a way that is possible to sequester. So if these biomass, for example, wood from, from trees, um, instead of getting biologically degraded or burned in wood fires, um, they can be paralyzed and uh, so they produce uh, during pyrolysis pyrogenic oils and biochar and both pyrogenic oils and biochar can be sequestered on the long term because they do not degrade uh, biologically in the same way as organic uh, biomass and a third um, a third solution is the increase of soil organic carbon. And so with these three solutions, um, increasing biomass, including wood biomass, but all types of biomass uh, extracts carbon dioxide from the atmosphere when it's growing. So the production of biomass, the increase of soil organic matter, and the transformation of exceeding biomass into biochar that can then be used in farming. Um, these three negative emission technology solutions are linked to organic farming. And I want to talk to you about these uh, possibilities uh, now. However, if we check on the land that's available today, um, where biomass could be produced to extract carbon dioxide, we quickly see there are some limitations. So today we have uh, 1,500 mega hectares of global cropland, but this type of agriculture in general uh, is responsible for 13% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So for the moment, agriculture is not a solution for climate change, but it's a burden because it's done in a way that is not sustainable and that loses more carbon dioxide than it takes up. So if we imagine, we imagine to use terrestrial carbon dioxide removal, TCDR, um, and do agriculture, then it's clear we cannot do it in this way of monoculture um, and intensive agriculture because it just emits more carbon dioxide. So in addition to that, we expect uh, that we will need uh, something like 500 mega hectares in extra for food production 
um, to feed the increasing um, global population and also um, the diet change. So that means uh, we do not have so much land left to produce biomass um, to extract carbon dioxide. So if you see, um, if you take off all the agricultural land, there's not much left uh, for biomass. If we further consider the areas of conservational interest, um, like for biodiversity protection or, or forest landscapes, then we still have less land available for biomass protection. And in our study of 2018, we calculated that there are only about 1,500 mega hectares available for biomass protection, uh, for biomass uh, production to extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. However, if um, this land that's currently uh, all uh, green land um, would be transformed into intensive biomass production areas, um, like with eucalyptus uh, plantation that is very um, fast growing, then we risk um, enormous uh, damages due to wood fire and in the end probably no much of a climate action. Uh, or if we think about the plantation of switchgrass or similar grasses um, in a monocultural way, then uh, it's only a question of time that pesticides treatments uh, will become necessary, herbicides, fertilizers, and all the vicious circle. Um, and that would certainly not be a sustainable solution for the climate or for the planet. And here comes the experience of organic farming into play that instead of just looking to land that's not currently used for agriculture, we rather transform our agriculture into climate positive uh, farming. And here we have different possibilities like uh, silver arable systems, uh, which means trees are combined with annual uh, crops, or we can talk about silver pasture systems where the pasture um, is improved with trees, shading trees, and that uh, increases biomass productivity. Or like in the case uh, we did here in Nepal in the mountains, like forest gardening, combining um, productive trees like banana or cinnamon uh, with annual or pluriannual crops, uh, which are very uh, productive systems and also produce biomass. We could also think about using um, the ocean with seaweed, shellfish and algae farming. We compare these different uh, organic carbon farming systems, um, we can see that the potential to sequester carbon is enormous, is more than 10 tons per hectare in tropical silver arable systems and tropical forest gardening, while um, these intensive biomass uh, monocultures like eucalyptus and switchgrass have lower um, carbon sink potential and do not produce any food or feed. So a key uh, solution within this framework is to include biochar production from the exceeding uh, farming biomass. And biochar production looks in a smaller scale, a bit like on, on this photo, just quickly explained. Um, you, you have uh, biomass that is uh, in, in smaller pieces like, like pellets. Um, and then it goes into the machine, so to exclude air. And then you heat up um, the biomass without air, so without oxygen, to 450 up to 900 degrees. And that means uh, this biomass gases out. 
and it remains um, only the carbon uh, backbone of the biomass. So it's 50% of the car of, of the carbon of the biomass is transformed um, into biochar, and the other 50% of um, of the carbon is transformed into a gas, pyrolytic gas that can either be condensed to pyrolytic oil or used for heat or electricity production when it is burned. Now that's in short how you produce biochar. Here you see how it looks like the biochar. It's a very porous uh, material. In fact, it's, it is like uh, charcoal, but not only made from wood, but from any type of biomass, um, from shrubs and um, rice husks, and grasses, and leaves. Uh, it can also be made from animal manure or even from biosolids. So main property, one of the main properties is the porous structure. We have like something like 300 square meter of surface area per gram of biochar. And in all these micro and meso pores, um, you can store uh, nutrient liquids. It works a little bit like a sponge, like you can see here. So the biochar soaks up uh, liquid nutrients and can give it back to the plants or to the soil ecosystems when is needed. So in organic systems, just as an example, biochar can be um, improved with animal urine. So in one liter of biochar, you can store one liter of animal urine. And one cow urination has enough nutrients for six maize plants, which is kind of enormous. So if you um, retain the liquid fertilizers from the animal system, or from human systems or from any other industrial food production. You can just mix the biochar one to one by volume ratio with the liquid nutrients. The biochar pores get filled with the nutrients and even if it rains, it withholds the nutrients because it needs some active removal uh, like from plant roots or from microbes that can um, get to the nutrients. So one cow is worth like six packs of uh, chemical fertilizer. And that's why we created um, this liquid manure pits, which are filled with biochar and the nutrients of the animals just flow into it and produces biochar-based fertilizer that you would apply then uh, into the root zone of a plant. So here is the example of uh, an onion plantation. You use only something like one ton per hectare of biochar um, where you have um, the liquid fertilizer mixed to the biochar, you apply to the root zone and you plant your uh, annuals on top of it. Or if you have pluriannuals, like here for tea production, um, you apply it uh, close to the roots into a ridge. You can also inject it, like here we did in Ghana in the cacao farm, or you apply it for trees around the canopy circumference. Just an example, uh, from a pumpkin trial that we did, you see here the application of the liquid biochar uh, fertilizer mixing with some compost. You then add some soil on it and apply uh, two seeds of pumpkin. And this is like two months after it, the pumpkin is just growing like crazy. Uh, on the substrate, so they grow uh, their roots through the biochar-based fertilizer in, into the soil and is optimal um, provisioned with nutrients and water. And then you get to the harvest, and here we can show you um, 
that the combination of cow urine and biochar increased the um, yield of the pumpkins compared to urine only so that means with the same nutrient amounts by more than 400 percent and that, that is that is just massive but it's not only on the low level that means we attained 80 tons of pumpkin production per hectare uh, in these trials and that is um, not only on one piece of land but we did farmer trials with uh, dozens of farmers uh, in the villages. Um, we did 21 field trials uh, with 14 different crops and we see these similar results not as extreme as with the pumpkin, but um, with cabbage, with cauliflower, with chili, or with tomato, and tea, and trees, we see an average doubling of the yield when using organic biochar-based fertilizer in the root zone. And on um, the right side, you see a diagram where we compare the um, mixing of the biochar with chemical fertilizers compared to the mixing with organic fertilizers, same amount of nutrients, and we are still much better with the organic fertilizer than with the chemical fertilizer. And that, that's, that's, an, that's a massive improvement um, if you look to um, organic farming in general. These results were from Nepal, but we also worked here in Bangladesh with uh, cabbage and with um, bitter gourds and ash gourds and pumpkins and, and other fruits. And we could also see uh, an increase of productivity by um, nearly 100% uh, compared to the control with chemical fertilizer. Um, we also work in Cuba, where you can see is about a third um, better yields in cassava. And so when you see here this more kind of manual trials in, in smallholder farming, we also work uh, with more industrial farming. And this liquid biochar fertilizer can also uh, be applied mechanically, as you can see here in an example from the United States. Um, very nice example you can see here on the left side, you have chemical uh, fertilizer with compost in a banana plantation. And on the other side, um, on the left side of the woman, so on our right side, you see a banana tree where we used organic fertilizer with biochar and compost. And you see a tree more than doubling. So um, summarizing the effects of using biochar, we just published uh, a paper um, in a review about 26 meta-analysis of using biochar in farming, so not only in organic farming, but in farming in general. And uh, we could see that in all more than 30 parameters that are relevant for agronomy, biochar improved the uh, productivity. Um, or improve the parameter. So, for example, when you have a contaminated cadmium contaminated um, field, and the biochar helps to reduce cadmium uptake. Or if you look to greenhouse gas emissions, like N2O emissions, biochar reduce them. Um, so, yield was increased, root biomass increased, photosynthetic activity increased. Now you can see when you look up to this paper that biochar really works in all kind of conditions. So here 
is compared the effect of biochar based fertilizer compared to conventional chemical fertilization. Uh, so the same nutrient amounts and the red line is the conventional fertilization. And you see that for all types of crops, soil conditions uh, and fertilization amounts, you find an improvement or at least equal results. The very important uh, effect also for the climate is that biochar um, helps to increase soil organic carbon. So if you want to increase soil organic carbon, you have in organic farming, you have a lot of different possibilities like mulching and shading and compost use, but the biochar added to all these soil organic carbon increase measures uh, optimizes the effects and you have um, large possibilities to increase soil organic carbon. So um, here we come to what we call the pyrogenic carbon capture and storage. So if we include um, the biochar making and the biochar use in organic farming, then uh, we transform biomass um, into biochar and bio oil. And the biochar can be used as animal feed or as biochar based fertilizer, which will increase the biomass productivity. So you have more biomass where you can retain the carbon from the atmosphere while the bio oil can be used for materials like for road construction. And this is the combination of organic carbon farming systems with pyrogenic carbon capture storage. So we can improve the carbon efficiency of these systems so that they really become uh, negative emission technologies combined the knowledge of the organic farmers and the new technology to become climate efficient. And so that the farmers can profit also from this climate action, uh, we created in 2020 the first carbon sink certificate. We can certify the biochar that's applied to soil and depending on the properties of the biochar and the soil and the farming system, we can evaluate um, and assess the amount of carbon that's put into a sink that will be retained for several centuries. And the farmer get paid for the carbon that will stay for more than 100 years at 100 euro per ton of CO2 equivalent. So this carbon certification system works already worldwide and is now implemented in several countries. Um, and to come to come to an end, um, I want to give you an outlook on the potential of this combination of organic farming with pyrogenic carbon capture and storage. So if we, um, if we go for 190 gigatons of biomass, that's what needed to um, produce 30% of the carbon sink that are necessary until the end of the century, as I showed you in the beginning. We need about 190 gigatons of biomass. It can be transformed with the carbon efficiency of 70% into biochar and pyro oil. And that would mean um, we would produce every year 3.8 billion tons of biomass extra on our agricultural lands for negative emission technology. That's massive. That is about 1% of the global biomass we would have to extract. Is that really possible? From an industrial point of view, we only would need about 400,000 industrial plants. So that would not be the limiting factor. But 
how about the biomass? Um, so this 3,800 million tons of biomass, as we said, is about 1% of global plant biomass. If that would be produced on the 51 million square kilometer of agricultural land, then we would only need to extract something like one ton of biomass per hectare. But if only 10% of the farmers would participate, we would still need 10% of the current agricultural land to produce biomass, like in this combined silvo pasture systems. But as we saw, we can increase the yield due to biochar-based fertilization. We would easily have 10% because productivity will be increased by more than 10%. And we could produce only 10% of the agricultural land, 7.5 ton of biomass per hectare and year. And that would mean we have no food competition, no feed competition, we can extract the carbon dioxide and produce the same amount of food as before if we optimize the systems. And here we come to the advantages of organic carbon farming versus chemical monocropping. We improve water capture and storage and protection of um, the subterranean water and water currents. We increase soil organic matter. It's an improvement on the biodiversity. Climate resilience improves, especially facing climate change with longer droughts, heavy storms, insects, and higher CO2. And we can cycle our nutrients do not need to introduce new chemical formulations where we optimize the recycling of nutrients. And so I can come to my conclusions. We need to establish, we need to establish biomass as part of agricultural production. Biomass is not a waste of agricultural production. And we have to focus to produce crops and biomass. And biomass is a type of crops and it will be the new crop of organic agricultural production. The combination of food and biomass production is highly carbon efficient and provides additional ecosystem services. And that's why farming needs to be included into all types of climate mitigation activities because pyrogenic carbon capture and storage as organic farming is ready for implementation, is ready for scale up and at much lower cost and lower risk than any other negative emission technology. Thank you very much for your attention. Hey, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, and Peter. Yeah. Zaba, thanks for your uh, wonderful speech. And uh, would you like to entertain one or two questions? Hello? Yeah. yeah. Would you like to uh, uh, entertain uh, one or two questions? Can you hear from me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, any question? Uh, because uh, 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 Mr. Hans Peter yeah, is on, online. Okay. So, any question? Uh, I, I would like to uh, raise my hand. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I introduce myself. Okay. I, sorry, I forgot it. I'm uh, Eddie Chen. I'm, I'm the former president of Mintao University and uh, the former dean of uh, Nanhua University. Okay. And uh, I established uh, the sustainability center six years ago. Okay, and so my colleague uh, worked very hard. My question is, uh, yeah, I I really impressed your your uh, presentation, and and my question is, uh, if we uh, burn the biomass, then we will make uh, carbon dioxide emission. Is that right? 
So if we didn't use the energy, the heat, from uh, we, when we burn uh, the biomass, then then it's a a, a positive uh, carbon uh, <laughs> uh, emission. Is a uh, is not the negative carbon. So what's your uh, idea? If we we didn't use uh, efficiently use the energy, the heat produced from we, when we burn in the uh, the biomass to make biochar. Okay. Yes. Um, so all the energy um, that is needed to make the biochar is energy that comes from the biomass. Yeah. There is no external energy that is needed. Yes. Now, if you use the biomass, for example, in composting, mm -hmm. then you also lose um, about 80% of the carbon in producing uh, the energy for degradation of the organic material in the compost. Yes. And when you do the pyrolysis, then uh, half of the carbon is still in the biochar, and the other half of the carbon was used for the energy to make the biochar and to produce some heat energy. So overall, the energy and the carbon balance is positive because the carbon that is in the biochar does not degrade. Mm -hmm. uh, when you use the organic matter, um, like in composting, then there is degradation and decomposition of the organic molecules that occur. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a good, good idea, yeah. And, uh, Good vision. Okay, so you you make certification for uh, the biochar production, then right? Okay, <laughs> very good. Any question? Other question? Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, Professor Chen. Okay, another Professor Chen. Okay. Okay. <laughs> In Cuba, <laughs> three times. <laughs> yes. Yes. If 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 I could do this uh, everywhere in the world, and with every farmer, then we would have no problems with food anymore. So you are right that this cannot be achieved in any setup. So the examples that I showed, they come from agricultural cultivation that is not optimized. So when we tripled the yield, we reached in the best fields the same yield amount that would be obtained under other optimal conditions. Like when we produced pumpkin in Nepal and quintupled, so five times the yield, then we reached uh, something like 85 tons of pumpkin per hectare, which is something that in optimal farming with chemical fertilizer, fertilization, um, plant protection, mulching. When you do 
all you can, you can reach the same yield also without biochar. But when you use the biochar, you can improve less optimal systems as you find in most of the farms and can improve uh, the yield, but also the quality of the crop. And um, you can reduce the risk of crop failure. So I do not pretend that everywhere you use biochar based fertilization, you can double the yield. But which would be the main message also here is then when you use biochar and organic fertilizer, you can reach at least the same yield than in conventional farming, which would already be uh, a massive advantage um, to convince farmers to switch to organic farming. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, is as your question? Okay, and uh, I heard that in Cuba, uh, because the the farmer uh, have no money to buy fertilizer, so it's very in, easy to increase their uh, production. Right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hans Peter. Yeah, really wonderful speech, and uh, yeah, you inspire a lot of people in the war. Okay, thank you very much.